everyone. I am Rosa Denae, the Innovation Manager here at Lloyd's. It gives me great pleasure to introduce today's Tuesday, Tuesdays with Lloyd's, which will be looking into the future of the sharing economy in the post-pandemic era. It's been a decade since Time magazine identified the sharing economy as one of its 10 ideas that will change the world. Looking back, the authors were spot on with their prediction. 10 years on, and we're all living through a global pandemic. So what does this mean for the sharing economy of today? The pandemic has, is recalibrating the sharing economy. Companies have had to adapt to changes in demand and look to pursue new growth opportunities, particularly in delivery services, but also in urban mobility and accommodation. Demand for share services now varies significantly depending on individual business models and companies are adapting to the new normal as consumer preferences may have shifted for indefinite time. A great example of consumer preference change is Airbnb. Since the pandemic started, Airbnb clients are searching for accommodation closer to home and are more interested in safety and affordability than before. Domestic bookings have more than doubled during the pandemic. Data also shows that renters now prefer trips to secluded cabins or cottages over major cities and are more likely to book a whole apartment than a room in shared accommodation. So what does this all mean when it comes to insurance? The insurance industry initially struggled to create protection that suits the needs of the sharing economy. However, over the last 10 years, the sharing economy has seen and brought with it a cultural shift in the, in, in the insurance sector. At the very essence of the sharing economy is the concept of flexibility. In line with this, insurance providers are being prompted to offer more flexible insurance solutions to suit the needs of this growing sector. As of late, the London market has had success in securing solutions for delivery platforms that utilize independent contractors and micro mobility firms. However, much more in this space needs to be done if the insurance industry is to address the requirements of the sharing economy. That being said, I believe a culture of innovation at Lloyd's is very much a part of its DNA. In 1904, in 1904, Lloyd's underwriters were the first to offer car insurance, but as no guidelines existed, they adapted what they knew. And this was marine insurance. So they then described a car to be a ship navigating on land. Lloyd's understands that partnerships with clients is key to creating new solutions to address client needs. From these meaningful partnerships, Lloyd's created the first aviation policy, satellite policy, drone policy, and many, many more to meet changing client needs. It is no different when it comes to the sharing economy. Lloyd's are here to drive long, meaningful partnerships where we can look to create solutions to meet the needs of those in the sector. Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our fantastic panel. We have Erin Abrams, who is General Counsel at VIA, Veer is the world's leading provider and developer of on-demand public mobility. Courtney Caldwell, who is co-founder and CEO at Shearshare. Dr. Ty Caldwell, who is co-founder and CEO at Shearshare also. Shearshare allows stylists to rent salon space whenever, wherever. And Colin Gardner, who is Chief Revenue Officer at Outdoorsy. Outdoorsy is a peer-to-peer -peer marketplace platform for RV rentals. And finally, we also have Chris Moore, who's going to be our moderator of today and heads up IBOT. Uh, Mark will be sharing the uh, bios of all our speakers in the chat box with you. So without further ado, I will hand over to Chris. Thanks, Rosie. Um, great pleasure to, to moderate this session. I'm really excited to hear from all these panelists. I've had the, the pleasure to work with them um, and discuss the their sort of approach to insurance and the products they look to buy for their platforms to support their marketplaces. And what's, what's fascinating for me is, is how all of them share a, an approach to buying insurance that is, that is truly innovative. They are not interested in off-the-shelf products. They are interested in products that are going to be tailor-made to their business that allows their platforms to grow and protects the marketplace and uses their platform. Safety is incredibly important to all these panelists. I think it's creating that insurance solution that is, is, is built for them that, that's truly important. Um, so it, it's different. And um, when I speak to these guys, 
Um, it's it's not a a view of insurance like it's that time of year again. I have to to renew my insurance policy. This is something they're constantly thinking about. It's that crucial for their business, and they're constantly looking for for partners that are willing to understand them, understand their business, uh, and support them in in these new products for for their dynamic sort of change in business. So I think it's going to be some some really fascinating topics covered today. So without further ado. I'm going to go around and ask each of the each of the panelists here to to just give a bit more flavour on their platform um, and the role that they participate in them. So I'm going to kick off to to Erin with uh, Via. Hi, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, I'm Erin Abrams. I'm general counsel at Via. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, Via is an on-demand shared ride software platform. Uh, so. While we do operate some consumer ride sharing services, uh, increasingly in the last few years, we have moved into uh, on-demand transit software and transit tech, uh, a category where we are the market leader. So we uh, have transit tech services in 200 uh, cities and countries around the world and counting, uh, and we license our software on a, a SaaS software as a service basis, um, as well as providing a full stack sort of turnkey solution for private and public transit operators. Uh, a lot of our clients are, a lot of our customers are our um, governments. So contracting with governments through uh, public procurement and RFP processes uh, is part of what we do, um, as well as providing our software to universities, hospitals, um, corporate campuses, and anyone who has a need to move people from point A to point B. Uh, for me, I'm the head of legal and historically have managed uh, insurance uh, just sort of as a legacy uh, function because I'm one of the earlier employees of the company. But as we've grown and scaled, we've gotten much more uh, involved with our finance team as well. And so now insurance is sort of co-managed uh, between the, the legal and finance functions and a team that we call risk. And I love that, that you say that you sort of looked after insurance because you're one of the earlier people in the companies. I see that so often that People within this in this economy haven't necessarily had insurance experience before and, and throw themselves into it wholeheartedly. And it's so fascinating to see that diversity of thought approach to our industry. Um, it's yeah, quite it's funny. funny. Like seven years later, people ask me, like, how did you get into insurance? And I'm like, well, oh, it was an early meeting. There was like probably five or six of us around the table. And our CEO asked, like, who wants to take on insurance? And I was like the only person who was willing to make eye contact with him at that moment. Um, and that's how I got <laughs> responsibility. <laughs> Yeah, and you've been regretting it ever since, I'm sure. <laughs> Not at all. It's been um, fun to learn about. It's been interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, Colin, um, do you want to talk about Outdoorsy and, and your role there? Yeah, I'd love to talk about Outdoorsy. So for uh, folks that don't know, Outdoorsy is the Airbnb of RVs. Uh, so I think uh, you can rent from your neighbors, friends, or strangers. Uh, their motorhome, trailer, caravan, uh, as they say, across the pond there. Um, and uh, in all that, you know, I think the big part for us is uh, in unlocking that market is providing insurance and the transaction uh, to cover both the renter and owner during it. Um, Outdoorsy uh, operates in Canada, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, moving to Europe as well. We'll hit about a, hit a billion in sales uh, here, I think a little bit ago. So uh, very much scaling and, uh, you know, very much a business that's uh, very hot right now, uh, given everyone's uh, stuck at home um, in a lot of ways. So uh, my role, Chief Revenue Officer at Outdoorsy, I focus on all things growth and monetization. Um, and so, you know, I think that's kind of a different approach. We don't view insurance as a cost center. We view it as a strategic advantage and we really use it to our advantage. Uh, and to that end, we've uh, not only invested in uh, having insurance during the, the rental period, uh, but also building out an insure tech arm, uh, Romley, I'm wearing the shirt, um, under the outdoorsy umbrella, which really focuses on a full suite offering of uh, RV insurance, RV owners uh, across the spectrum. Um, so we really view that as a strategic advantage for us uh, and one that, you know, really serves our clients 24-7, uh, uh, even outside of the rental period. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, I think it's, it's fascinating the role that you've adopted and, and, and like you say investing into insurance and taking a more active role i look forward to diving into that a bit deeper thank you um ty courtney caldwell um uh good to see you guys um, yeah you too is it okay if you um introduce share share uh and, and talk about your role i think we first met at a, at a meet the market day in lloyd's in texas so it's, it's great <laughs> to be chatting again it's a, it's a great story 
<laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks for having us, Chris. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we, we've always been so fond of, of Lloyd's mm -hmm. and everything that y'all brought to the table. We're out of McKinney, Texas with the Caldwells, Dr. Yeah. Ty, myself, and Courtney Caldwell. We're the co-founders of ShareShare. Share. Yeah. And ShareShare, Share, for those who don't know, it's the first machine learning enabled mobile marketplace that connects salon and barbershop owners to individual stylists to fill their empty salon space by the day. So you heard Colin and Outdoorsy say that they're like the Airbnb for RVs. Um, Share Share, we're affectionately known as Hair B and B, and so that's an easy way to remember Share Share. <laughs> um, but we started this uh, because it was the own problem that we had in our salon um, many many years ago, um, and today Share Share is now in over 800 cities. We're getting stylists back to work safely and uh, private, sanitized, safe salon spaces to work by the day, and we're helping to keep our brick and mortar small businesses open. Um, we came to Lloyd's because we knew that we wanted an insurance um, option for our marketplace of salon owners, barbershop owners, and independent contractor stylists. Um, because we've been in the industry for 30 years, my husband earned his doctorate degree in professional barbering cosmetology, wrote a number one best-selling book on how to be successful in this industry, and then my background, 20 years in B2B tech marketing for companies like Oracle and Zendesk and Zenefits, we said, you know what, because we are really trying to up, up end and up level these independent contractors and really give them um, in, uh, businesses that they need, small businesses, tools that they need uh, where they are, which is on their mobile device, but allow them to pay for that by the day. And so we knew that if we were going to partner with anyone in the insurance um, industry, it was going to be Lloyd's. And so now today, Silas can find workspace on the share share platform by the day. And they can also purchase professional liability insurance for just five bucks. And it's been amazing because again, as people start to come out of COVID, people start to come out of these stay at home mandates, um, they're able to rebuild their businesses on their terms. Um, and we're just ha happy that we're being able to, to support them in that regard. Thank you. That's excellent, guys. I think it's been, um, like I said, we've spoken a few years ago and what was brilliant is you, you guys had thought about the insurance need right at the outset. And I thought yeah, yeah. You, I, when you talked to me about how safety was important, how protection was important, uh, yeah. it's so often for a lot of companies an afterthought and it's mm -hmm. almost we're ready to launch who's done insurance and then you're That's sort right. of backtracking and we're working <laughs> to three day deadlines. But you guys had it from from the start. It was such a key pillar to your business. And I think that's really impressive. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And we're, we're grateful to you guys, honestly, Chris, because no other insurance company well, would take the risk, mm -hmm. you know, uh, at the time. You know, they, they didn't really understand the beauty industry. They didn't understand that we're the second largest industry for freelancers and independent contractors. Um, and so you guys jumped in that big ocean with us. And so we appreciate that. Uh, thank you. I, I definitely do not understand the beauty industry as it's probably viewable <laughs> for, for everyone on this call. No, not at all. I'm trying. Erin, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll jump to you and, and, and just a bit more of a deeper dive in, into the insurance side and what, what role insurance plays for VIA and how that might be differ from, you know, more of a traditional um, company, someone that has, you know, large auto exposures. How is insurance different for you and how do you view it? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. And I would say, you know, one of the things that we have appreciated about working uh, with you all at Apollo is that that willingness that um, Dr. Ty and Courtney were kind of alluding to of like being willing to dig into a novel business model uh, and explore its intricacies and look at how it's different from legacy operators. Um, that's kind of like a feature uh, that we really need in order to be able to ensure our business successfully and that you've been kind of willing to engage with us as a, as a thought partner on that journey. So we really appreciate that. Um, but for us, you know, we're first and foremost a tech company providing transit software. Um, but because we also provide transit operations, we do have some physical real world, you know, auto operations um, and with it comes auto risk. And so, you know, while we do need to ensure our auto exposure, it's not the same traditional auto exposure as a, as a legacy transit provider, um, you know, that has a sort of asset heavy model uh, with employees and owned vehicles. Um, you know, we primarily work with independent contractors and, uh, you know, we don't typically own the vehicles that operate on our platform. Uh, in some cases, we operate the deployments. Uh, in other cases, our partners operate the deployments. And so a sophisticated understanding of the different risk profiles for those different deployments is, is super important. Also, a lot of our partners are governments. Um, so they have different risk tolerances and they might require different customized limits for a specific project. Um, and then also depending on the use case of the project, 
there might be um, you know different risk factors that are at play. So if we're offering a service that's not a medical, non-emergency medical transport um, or paratransit service or uh, educational transport for students, you know all of those uh, different use cases for our technology, um, you know factor into the insurance um, that that we need to successfully ensure um, uh, the deployment. So it, it tends to be very bespoke, um, and because we are um, you know required to uh, bid in competitive procurements for a lot of our 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 transactions, um, we need to be able to have like a, a shelf program of insurance uh, that we can kind of pull down specific bespoke insurance coverage from that meets the needs of a specific program or deployment, uh, and sometimes on pretty short notice um, to be on our mm -hmm. customer's timeline. Uh, and that's not really how the insurance industry is traditionally set up, um, but we really appreciate and essentially need that level of flexibility and customization. Because for us, if we're you know bidding in a competitive procurement, if we don't get the insurance piece priced right, you know on a price per ride basis, then we might not be competitive on that contract. Uh, so it's really important for us to kind of bake in the insurance costs into the margins and have some predictability uh, about what those insurance costs will be. Thanks, Erin. And I certainly want to dive deeper um, later in this discussion on that flexibility and customization and, and how that can't be done in isolation. There's not one party that has to produce that. That has to be collaborative. So I appreciate that. And um, moving over to you, Colin, and, and the insurance role, I want to pick up on the comment you said when you introduced Outdoorsy that insurance isn't just uh, an enabler for your business. It could potentially be pivoted into a, a revenue generation and a, and a business generator. So can you touch a bit more on that and, and talk about why you made that investment that you talked about of taking a more active role in insurance? Yeah, uh, for sure. I'd love to get more into it. The um, Just overall as a philosophy, like we, we view like everything that kind of can be viewed as like a hurdle or a cost is like something that can become an advantage over time. And specifically for marketplaces, like what are your most, you know, what are the things that differentiate um, and really give you control. And for us, that's insurance in a lot of ways. And in particular, insurance is core to the user experience for an owner for us. So imagine you're renting your RV out, uh, you have an accident, uh, or sorry, the renter has an accident. Um, your RV goes offline and you have these bookings in the future. If we're not able to quickly adjudicate the claim, uh, get you paid and back on the road, you're losing income as well. And so for us, what we realized is by not you know, owning this in a very core way in the business, um, and really getting to know it, understanding it, and working with flexible partners like yourself, Chris, we weren't going to be able to deliver the best experience both for renters and owners because no one wants to get their booking canceled because this owner's you know, RV is no longer usable, things like that. So it's really important for us to own that. And so that's why we've also invested in our own claims company uh, in-house as well. And you know, overall, as we look at it, we see it as a strategic mode because as we take more of the you know, processes in-house, we also control the costs. Um, and therefore can, you know, charge less than our competition, um, as well as, you know, make it a profit center for us and really control that in a very meaningful way. So that's a, that's a big uh, reason why we've done it that way. Yeah, thank you. Fascinating approach to it. Um, Ty, Courtney, I'll, I'll flip the same question to you guys. I'm sure um, the words flexibility, customization, <laughs> and, um, you know, that customer experience resonates with you guys. Um, oh, yeah. but, but please talk to me about what the, what the philosophy was, what your approach was to, the, to that insurance product that, that you clearly felt was key to share. share. Yeah. Well, we, we know since the industry is growing and we know that the brick and mortar is not just as important now as the licensed professionals, we know that they're a business amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. They control their book mm -hmm. of business. Uh, a lot of the stylists, a lot of the licensed professionals and beauty professionals, they're independent contractors, uh, they're commission-based, and they're also salary-based. And so even in that aspect of it, there still needs to be a layer of insurance that needs, they need to protect their clients with, even undergirding that brick-and-mortar uh, insurance that needs to be had as a business. So we, we took it upon ourselves to say, how can we you know, keep our um, customers satisfied with the platform? And you have to always let them know that you think about them first. But at the end of the day, if something happened, the first per the first thing that people think about is not just blaming the host or blaming the professional, <laughs> but blaming the platform. So we want to always give them an opportunity to look back and say, hey, you know what? Share Share is taking care of us. They're thinking about us first. And it's not just about, you know, collecting a dollar, you know, and, right. and being a part of a platform as a number, but they're really looking at how, how they're taking care of us and how we're looking at their growth in their business. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and again, like Ty said, you know, these uh, independent uh, licensed beauty and barbering professionals, they are solopreneurs. Mm -hmm. They're like a small business of one, right? And so yeah. there's no ecosystem right now where they can just go and say, well, I need that tool today and I can pay for what I use mm -hmm. that doesn't exist. And so Shearshare um, is looking to become that, that B2B ecosystem. No matter what small business you are, though, I think there are three constants. You're always looking to increase your revenue, decrease your costs, and mitigate your risk. And so people use and leverage the ShareShare Share platform to build their small businesses atop our small businesses because they know that, that when they come to ShareShare, Share, they're, they're able to get those resources um, very easily, yeah. be able to access what they need, but also be able to maximize their earnings potential. And so, um, again, insurance is just a big part of that because as a brick and mortar, if you're a ShareShare Share host, a salon and barbershop, shop or spot owner on the platform, you already have um, that, uh, that insurance because you, it's mandated by your city, by your state, but not always does that happen when you are an independent contractor. And then again, where do you go to just purchase that by the day? That did not exist before Share Share and Lloyd decided to partner together. And so, yes, we have mm -hmm. pioneered on-demand um, workspace for beauty and barbering professionals. And here we are again, pioneering um, professional liability insurance by the day. I think, I think when, when we've spoken, you've touched on things. I think I've had these similar conversations with, with Colin from Outdoorsy, but you talk about it, it's more than just providing that insurance product. It can give you a stickiness with your customers, right? Your yeah. customers your customers can walk down to their local beauty salon and see if they can negotiate an ability to go down there. But the reason they're going to come to the share share platform, you'd hope is because that community feel yeah. that support you give them. Mm -hmm. And because they have access to that insurance product, which gives them the protection they need, that's Why right. would they go outside the platform, right? I know mm -hmm. off-platform bookings are something mm -hmm. that people need to be mindful of. Right. I think it's that it's that support services that will keep them coming back oh, to share share. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um, even beyond that, you know, when we ask people, you know, why is it that you'd rather, you know, leverage share share versus doing it on your own and cold calling mm. or asking a peer for recommendations to work out of a particular salon or barbershop, they say, well, because you guys are doing something different in the industry, like every other industry um, has been, you know, almost eaten alive by software, right? And so mm. barbering and beauty seems to be one of the last tranches. Yeah. <laughs> We're like a dinosaur in that. And so so it's sure, sure. We're just trying to tech out, you know, whatever we already know people are doing. And because, you know, we are from the industry, people constantly tell us, I'm so glad you guys are not two random engineers who thought you were coming up with the best thing, you know, for our industry. Like when I look at you guys, I see myself. And so I know that you're always going to have my best interests at heart. I know that you, you understand my day-to-day -day challenges, my very unique day-to-day -day challenges. And so when you guys put forth an option or a new product or a new service and support area, I know that I can trust it. And we have to really think about the grand, the bigger grand scheme of things. Anything could liable to happen if you're yeah. if you're uh, presenting a service or if you are working on a client. You know, you mm -hmm. could, you know, hopefully this doesn't happen. You could nip their ear with the clippers. You could burn them with the curling iron. You yeah. could, you know, potentially put on a product too long and it hurt their skin. Mm -hmm. Or you could, to the uh, to the circuit breakers, you could pop a circuit oh, yeah. breaker. Anything could happen. And so to having that insurance gives them that protection that they need and it really eases their mind. Yeah. Yeah. I love, I love the idea of, you know, they see you guys and there's that trust. They feel part of it. Yeah. When I first started looking at entering the sharing economy, I used to be fully suited and booted in my Lloyd's outfit, tie, <laughs> bl black shoes. I think after that first trip to Silicon Valley, I came back and said, well, I've got to buy some polo shirts, t-shirts. some hoodies. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm wearing a shirt today, but I promise you, I've looks great. my normal get up. Erin, yeah. um, I, want, I wanted to come to you. I know that um, for you guys, data is such an important part of your business. And from working with you, it's, it's fascinating how data you know, can feed that insurance and feed those decisions that you make, whether it's what city you launch in, how you, you know, schedule your routes, all those sort of things. But can you give a, a deeper dive for, for what data means to the business and how that relates to insurance? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we are first and foremost uh, a software and technology company. And so, you know, our real asset is the data that we uh, that we have about our routes that are dynamically updating and configurable, our patented technology around virtual bus stops, uh, where to pick up and drop off, um, you know, different people within our service zones. Um, and then, you know, very granular data that we have on, uh, you know, whether 
rides are happening in, in phase one, phase two, phase three, uh, which translates into insurance purposes. Uh, you know, how many passengers are in the vehicle, where they're being picked up and dropped off, um, you know, and uh, uh, a variety of different pieces of data that feed into our proprietary software and make the routes uh, more efficient. Um, and then also data that we provide uh, to our partners, um, you know, who are municipalities and private and public transit operators about how people are using our services. Um, and a lot of that, you know, goes to efficiency and sustainability, making sure that um, our partners are using their fleets in an efficient way and filling uh, vehicles to the greatest extent possible and not just driving around empty or underutilized vehicles, but filling the most number of seats in vehicles, um, you know, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and increase efficiency. And also to make sure that they're serving, you know, in the cases of municipalities, uh, you know, that they're serving lower income communities or people who are in transit deserts who might lack access to other modes of transportation. And our data can show them, you know, how much they're reaching those vulnerable populations. So that data is super important to us. Um, and then also I should mention our safety data you know, data around, uh, you know, the vehicles and how they are are driving and how they're, you know, how often they get into accidents and, um, you know, data that we're starting to receive from uh, telematics companies uh, that further track uh, the safety of the drivers in the vehicles. So all of this data is very, you know, important and valuable for us. I think when we share that data with our insurance partners, um, we really, first and foremost, we want to make sure that we're getting credit for that data, especially because, you know, we, you know, we think that our data shows uh, that we are a lot more safe as an operator than maybe some of the legacy transit operators that have operated in this space. Um, and so we think that, you know, regardless of what industry trends show and, you know, maybe other legacy operators have a worse safety record or a worse track record, you know, we think we should kind of be judged on the merits of our own data um, and our own strong safety mm -hmm. record. And the fact that we have more data to share with insurers should enable them to make more granular, um, you know, calculations okay. about our risk, which should benefit us as well. And Chris, this is one area that we've worked really closely in, which we sincerely appreciate is like, you know, I view it as a two way street, like we can share a lot of granular data, and then you can use that granular data to get a much more precise view of exactly which buckets of risk um, to focus on and which, you know, issues are maybe lower risk, um, and then not have like a blanket insurance policy that's kind of across the board, all things to all people, um, but really kind of focus um, on the areas of risk and tailor the rates accordingly. Um, so that's a very important, you know, issue around our data. I think the other thing I would mention on data is we have a great concern and, you know, are very focused on how people use the data that we share with them. Um, so if we share data with, you know, brokers or insurance companies or telematics operators, you know, on one hand, we think telematics are, are a great solution and can meaningfully improve the way that we deliver, um, you know, safe rides to people and can give us early warning signs about, you know, heartbreaking and acceleration and things that we want to look at, you know, to make sure that drivers are driving safely. Um, on the other hand, if we're going to turn over a lot of granular ride specific data to a telematics company, we want to understand what they're doing with our data to make sure they're not selling our data on the back end or packaging it into industry insights that can easily be sort of reverse engineered and disaggregated. Um, so we, you know, our data is really important to, you know, our product and we want to make sure that when we share it, um, you know, that that benefits us and our customers and that it's being used in an appropriate way that takes into account, you know, privacy and all of the different like um, uh, privacy regimes uh, that we're subject to. Yeah, I, I, I love a lot of things you just said there. And I think, I think from from an actuarial engagement, um, it, it may not come as a surprise to, to you guys on here, but maybe to some of the audience that within our iBot team, we have more data and actuary actuarial resource than we do underwriting resource purely because that data is so rich. And it's not a case of, like you say, just consuming data, consuming data, not knowing what you're going to do with that data and, and just storing it for, for data's sake. For us, it's about collaboration. We don't, we don't want to be, it costs money to store data, it costs time and effort to take data. We only want data that's going to be you know, of value. And so what we tend to do, and we've done that's very successful with the VIA team and others, is have our actuaries speak to actuarial people, data scientists and engineers in, in your company, and actually, you know, collaborate, right? Truly partner and say, right, okay, what do you think the rating factors? These are the data points that we're, that we're pulling. Um, and let's make decisions. What, what I love about it is when we can give you that transparency about what we think is moving the needle from an insurance cost the dynamism that a company like VIA has to actually change that during the policy period. So you can say, if you're seeing a trend that, hey, this is performing a bit worse than we think, you can spend your effort and change that during the policy period. It's not a case we have to make changes every 12-month iterations. I think that's one of the most fascinating things is 
actually using that data to make empowered decisions and completely agree with you has to be both ways has to be an interaction it cannot be i think one of one of uh, my clients once referred to insurance as a data vampire um, which I, I i can kind of defend and say it's not true but in other cases it could be true and uh, I, I do take your point. It has to be that two-way street and the data has to be added value. Otherwise, it is a massive IP for you and why would you share it? So thanks for those insights. Colin, um, I know data is huge for you guys. Uh, and during the pandemic, you were constantly sharing the trends that you were seeing amongst your user base. I mean, you have more information about your hosts and, and their behaviors than any other insurance company who's looking to sell to them. And that's why you're uniquely positioned, I suppose, with the approach you're taking. But can you dive a bit into to data for the outdoorsy business? Yeah, for sure. So we we try to collect as much data as fully possible. And that's always been an in infrastructure that we've invested in uh, heavily. And uh, you know, I think by insurance during the rental period, but also provide uh, insurance for them outside the rental period. So they're personal policies, think of it that way, um, as well as commercial policies. And so one of the great parts about collecting all this data is that we're able to quote very quickly. We already know all of their information about their vehicles, things like that. Um, and so using that, we're able to, you know, create with uh, Chris and other folks is uh, innovative ways of rating that, uh, using that data specifically around rental usage. We know how many days they're renting it, um, you know, when it's had maintenance and things like that. So we're just using very unique data points that other people don't have. Um, and to do very interesting things for them underwriting uh, actuarial perspective. Uh, but overall for us, you know, collecting data is just uh, the core part of it because I, I think Aaron hit on this, all about optimization, right? Both for the user experience, um, but also for, you know, your business, right? And running it the best way you possibly can for everyone. Uh, when we get data, we're, we're trying to figure out that our, our users, what they want, right? And what we can deliver to them on a daily basis to make sure they are safe. Like as a platform, we care a lot about retaining our users, right? Um, and so we want to use that data to deliver the best in class products so they don't go anywhere else. Um, and we want to be one stop shop. And so I think that's the piece I've always appreciated uh, working with uh, Lloyd's on this is that the more data we give, we also get more customization back, right? And I think that flexibility is really important um, just generally. I don't know if people know RVs that well, but you know, there's motorized, there's towable, there's some that are like 50 feet long, there's some that are like 10 feet long. And they just and they behave differently, right? And they are just it's not one size fits all. And as I think uh, we've got on the journey together uh, to build the best, the best rental product out there for RVs, it's a uh, it's a learning experience for both sides as we get deeper and deeper. We're the experts on RVs, but we're not necessarily you know the experts on creating insurance uh, for those RVs. And I think as we get deeper into that and understand those rating factors together, what really pushes and moves the needle, it's really important and collaborative. And I think uh, you know another area that we, we've spent a lot of time on, and I think uh, you know I think it's probably don't not talk about much in this sense is the risk mitigation part of it, is understanding your risk before you write them, right? Um, and so we invest mm -hmm. very heavily in machine learning models and data points of trying to understand not just traditional MVRs and drivers checks and things like that. Like people have driving records, but they're not necessarily RV driving records, right? Um, so for us, trying to build a rating model for people before they, you know, rent is really important. And so we've actually built very custom machine learning uh, around that with partners uh, to really understand what's the propensity of a claim uh, for those users. And once we have that, we can change our rating. We can charge more. We can, you know, decide to have a higher deductible. We can have a higher security deposit. We can solve it from a business perspective because we actually mm -hmm. know um, and have high correlation. So. I think the more data you have, the better products you can deliver and the better expectations you can set for your users as well. Yeah, I, I love that say, risk management like piece. Hot. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, go please, Aaron. No, I was just gonna jump in and say, I feel like RVs are like the super hot trend of this summer, especially <laughs> in the COVID <laughs> pandemic. I live in, in Manhattan and I've talked to so many families that are like, oh, what are you doing this summer? And we're renting an RV and driving I it to the national parks. <laughs> and like, you know, they don't own an RV and park it in lower Manhattan. Like they're obviously renting it. <laughs> And they've never, yeah. they probably have never driven an RV before. They probably don't drive a regular car that often either. Um, so it's like this whole new hot thing. And I imagine that Colin, you're just really in the thick of that trend. Yeah, I think from April to October, we grew like 4,600%, just just nuts. You know, I mean, I think everyone in travel was a pretty worried in about March uh, about what things were going to do, <laughs> us included. And 
we then just had a hockey stick and just went insane. Um, and, and realistically, we just think it's pulling the trend forward, uh, specifically in America, road travel and just local travel has been just growing. Um, and mm-hmm. so we really just think it, it advanced kind of this move back to the outdoors um, and really getting to open spaces um, and realigning people to that. And so that's just been really exciting to see just generally. And I think it's very good for mental health for everyone um, to be outdoors, not just like flying in a hotel, uh, you know, not, nothing wrong with that, but uh, I would highly suggest an RV. <laughs> Yeah, Thank, thanks, Colin. It's really interesting. Yeah. Um, Ty, Courtney, I'll, I'll come to you guys. I know, Courtney, with your background, I'm sure data is incredibly important for you. Oh, yeah. um, and, and for your business, I suppose it's it's a lot about when we've had discussions, not just what you're doing with the data today, but the data you're building for, for the future, right, and how your business yeah. will evolve and the decisions you'll make will be driven by that data. Can you, mm-hmm. can you talk about what you're collecting, what you're looking to do with that data? Oh, yeah. You know, when we first started ShareShare, I don't think that we understood the type of owned data that we were collecting, you know, data points that no one has ever asked before. You know, so at this point, when we're having conversations with you guys and even um, potential um, you know, strategic partners, we were able to now tell you, you know, based on region of the country, how many days a licensed stylist works. Um, what their um, propensity to travel more than 10 miles outside of their home base is. Mm-hmm. Um, do nail techs in New York in New York operate differently than a barber in California? And so that's the kind of information that we have at our disposal. And that helps us too to kind of come back down to the level of, you know, how can we best serve what we feel is like the best industry in the world, these licensed beauty and barbering professionals. And so when we think about um, maximizing that user experience, like really tailoring it so that it's a personal experience on the platform, that data um, is, is mandatory, you know, building in that machine learning so that we not only give them the best customer experience, but it's certain things like dynamic pricing, right? And being able to add mm-hmm. that in. If you think about share share as you would, um, renting maybe an RV early on or renting uh, or, or purchasing a plane ticket, right? Maybe your price is going to look different if you're booking two weeks in advance mm-hmm. versus the day before. And so just thinking about how they also think, because when we start asking stylists, you know, why are you booking like 10 different locations in Dallas, Texas, when we know that you loved that first one you went to and they tell us, well, you know, I'm really conscious about the customer experience when I'm thinking about my clientele. And so I know that, you know, Colin may like a more um, rugged type of, you know, barbershop environment. I know that Aaron loves like a, um, a mom's who lunch type of environment. And so because of that, they are truly choosing their workspaces based on the personality of their clientele. And so knowing that plus knowing their, um, their, their sensitivity to price, you know, we're again, taking all that data and making sure that we're pro- providing that personalized experience for them. And, and really, you know, I don't know who said it, but I remember someone saying he with the best data wins. And, and I think we see that uh, consistently. One of the things I will say and add to what Courtney's saying is that I tell the team, in all departments, good, bad, and different. I don't care what it is. All data is good data. Yeah. So do not take it as a bad thing if they don't like something or if they do a bad review. It's all data because people are telling you what they want in their reviews, in their likes or their dislikes yeah. of the platform. And one thing that one of the things that I can say, going back to your last question that we learned about the pandemic, is that two things about this industry: we learned that the government really wasn't looking at the beauty industry as an essential. Um, category when it came to jobs. Yeah. And also we realized that the brick and brick and mortar wasn't as important as they thought they were. Mm. Because once mm-hmm. all business was shut down and everybody went to zero, mm-hmm. people were in survival mode. So a lot of those licensed professionals mm. and a lot of those customers say, you know what, I know I can't go into the salon. Can you come to me? Can mm-hmm. I come to you? Mm-hmm. And they couldn't go into the they couldn't go into the hotels because everything was closed. Mm-hmm. So they had to go into the home, whether that be garage, whether that be kitchen, whether that be, mm. you know, a living room. The thing, the, the main thing became the licensed professionals were deemed essential. We go to school to understand precautionary uh, learnings about skin, hair, skin and nails, the derma, everything about the, the this, this profession is based on precautionary understanding yeah. and the professionalism of what we do. I'm sure that Aaron understands that coming to New York, one of the biggest uh, metropolitans in in the uh, in the in the na- in the states, and realizing that beauty runs pretty much everything, whether it be products, <laughs> whether it be tools, 
whether it be going into Walmart, picking up whatever you need, or from mm-hmm. the uh, from the, uh, the the corner store, products. The beauty is is running the is running the world right now. We're a multi trillion dollar industry, and so we understand what we're building. So the data points that that you were talking about with Courtney is is essential and is a is a mainstay for how we're building our technology right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's I really, really intuited that uh, after a year of COVID and having my my stylist come to my house and having my uh-huh. eight year old son help me wash my color out of my hair uh-huh. in my bathtub, <laughs> that I would like nothing more than exactly. uh, mom's new lunch spa day. <laughs> like my dream. Got you covered, Eric. Got you covered. <laughs> At least you had a stylist. I can I can honestly vouch that my wife is not a beauty professional. Uh, my hair has only just recovered. Um, but there we are. <laughs> Looks great. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Um, Aaron, I, I'm going to come to you because I know we talked to, um, at the, you know, at the start of this call that you didn't necessarily come from a, a, a rich insurance background. Um, but talk me about your experience of, 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 of the insurance industry thus far. And there's going to be a lot of brokers, a lot of underwriters on this and, and, and also some, some potentially some risk managers that are about to start looking at insurance or, or trying to get a, a better interaction with the insurance market. Do you, do you have any advice and pearls of wisdom as to how those people should approach insurance in the sharing economy? Because I'm a massive believer and everyone knows me. I, I think that the approach has to be different when you're in such a dynamic, a tech data driven business. Um, yeah, just just would love your opinion on that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that, w- that was generous. Didn't necessarily come from a rich insurance background. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, <laughs> You know, and I think especially, you know, coming from a background as a lawyer and working at a high growth startup, a few things have struck me, especially as I've interacted, you know, with varying results with, uh, you know, insurance brokers and underwriters and like the legacy insurance industry in general. Um, And one is that, you know, I would say like to generalize, and I don't think this necessarily applies to you all at, at uh, Apollo, who are quite forward thinking, um, but in in many other experiences that I've had, I'm struck by how much insurers look at um, the past as a predictor of the future um, and are so focused on a company's loss history, an industry's loss history, um, and in particular looking at like distant past, at least from a startup's perspective of three to five years in the past, and thinking that that will be the best data with which to predict the future. Um, And for us, like most of us got into these various different businesses to disrupt the legacy industries. Um, So I don't think that like legacy industry data is necessarily the best predictor of where our business is going. And especially with us, we kind of iterate at at light speed. We're always adapting new products and new services based on the needs of our customers. Um, We might pivot more than once um, in a policy year. Um, So I think you know, for us, the past is not always the best predictor of the future. You know, speaking about data, that is some data that you have, it's an input. Um, But in terms of advice, you know, to brokers and underwriters, I would say, you know, my advice is to engage with us in the thought exercise of where will our business be a year from now? Where will our business be three years from now? You know, will we be using more electric vehicles? Yes. Will we be using more autonomous vehicles? Yes. Will the way that people get around cities post COVID change? Yes. So all of those things to think about those projections and what are they based on? What are the assumptions? What are the risk factors? But really trying to dig into that forward looking view, because that's how startup founders and and startup employees kind of think about the world is how are we going to change the world? How will the world be different a year, two years, three years from now? And how will we be best positioned to capitalize on that change? Um, And so, you know, with our colleagues at Apollo, I think we've really done a nice job of kind of iterating on that model and thinking about, you know, where do we need to recalibrate? Where do we have, you know, less risk? Where do we have more risk? Um, But I think to folks who are maybe listening in on this call, the advice that I would have is to be able to move very fast um, because we move really fast and sometimes we get a bit frustrated that the insurance industry doesn't move at warp speed all the time. Um, And also to be a little bit more flexible and nimble in your thinking and willing to adapt uh, to to business models that also can change at light speed. Yeah, I I think that's that's a fantastic point in terms of looking forward and not always looking back. I think the thing you touch on there is it's your your business is and, and and all three of your businesses right are so dynamic that I think the only way you can look forward is having that regular contact and one of the the silver linings from for me from from the pandemic has been the ability to get on Zoom and just say hey your company is pivoting during during the pandemic your company is changing I mean we've seen Via have different models in in different cities that has changed and and, and the tie up with the municipalities and just having that can we just get a bit more regular contact so I can keep looking forward as what your view of the future is, because 
it can change very quickly and within three to six months you could be hey we've gone in a different direction uh, and i think it's so important so I, I always come back to that partnership um, but i think that's really interesting thanks erin colin uh I'd, l- I'd really like your views on this. I think from, from people I do business with, you probably use the word why a lot more than, more than others. As in, why does insurance do this? Why, do, why does your industry do it like this? Why, why, why do you have these really complicated rate filings in, in states? Um, I know that you've taken a, a, very, a very deep role, a deep dive into insurance, but what's some of your learnings and, and advice to us in the industry? Because we're all ears. This is your chance. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Like Aaron, I, I have no deep insurance background, but I, uh, I, I do have degrees in math and econ. And uh, my, my first job was working in, in doing like statistical modeling. So I, I like very much understand like the, like the methods, right? And I think um, not knowing about insurance, only having bought insurance, you know, for my car and house and things like that. Um, it, kind of, it just, I think allows a new lens. But um, I, I think the thing for me that's really big, at least with tech is like, there's like, you know, insure techs, but there's also insurance for tech, right? And I think like thinking and not bucketing these things is like the same things, like is really important because all the businesses here are using insurance as like a lever, right? Um, mm-hmm. And it's an enabler. And it's very different, I think, than kind of what you see when you think of tech and insurance. Um, and so I, I think just being able to mentally divide those things and really think about this insurance for tech marketplaces, the sharing economy, right? is really about these marketplaces are aggregating consumers, right? The aggregation of consumers is changing fundamentally, right? Like if you think about Outdoorsy, we're giving people financial stability and freedom, and we're really filling bank accounts with money, right? And so when you start to think about how people are behaving and coming to us, right? They're using like, we're like almost their source of income uh, in a bank in some ways, right? And so like, as we, as you think about that and try to deal with people, you got to realize that it's, yes, these companies are your customer, but the end customer, like their customer is actually consumers, right? And mm. so really always trying to go, and I think our CEO, Jeff Cavins, uh, like always just beats me over the head with this is like, start with the customer and solve backwards. And like, yes, we may be your customer in the sense that we're paying a bill, but at the end of the day, the consumer is the customer, right? And we're aggregating, we're like, we're bringing those people together in a certain way in a certain risk profile and behavior. And it's just characteristic of that group, right? Um, and so I think just thinking differently about it is really important um, just overall from that perspective. Um, but yeah, um, that would be my, my two cents for folks. I, uh, I, I agree with Aaron, you know, like it, it's like with any like, you know, modeling of anything, there's no observation of something crazy in the past, then you no prediction of it in the future, right? Um, and so I think it's really about you know, being creative with the people you're working with and understanding different ways of like handling the risk, whether it's not as strictly on the premium or if it's like, however you like get collateral or however it is, right? It's like, just think outside the box because um, in a lot of ways you're investing in a startup um, with your money as a, you know, an insurance professional, right? You're just doing it in a different way. Uh, it may not be for equity or things like that, uh, but it's for premium over time. And so I think uh, that's what uh, I think Chris does well is, you know, he sees opportunity, invest in it, and they grow together. And I think that's ultimately, you know, really important for all of this. Um, if you want to work on this insurance for tech companies uh, side mm-hmm. of it. Yeah, I think, I think you've touched on a really interesting point there is when you, when you look at the marketplace, what a lot of people will, will sometimes think of the sharing economy is it's more of a personal lines play, right? That you're set, you need an insure tech solution. You need to sell individual policies to individual consumers. That's, that's not necessarily the case. Because trust is so important, because you want to improve the user experience, you can actually partner with a platform like a Veer, a ShareShare, and an Outdoorsy and, and have those guys administer, like you say, that aggregated pool. So you can bring it into a commercial line setting, use the vast amount of data to actually make it quite an, a nice position to underwrite because when you are in a personal line setting, you don't know what policy you're going to get, right? You hope that you, you target a certain demographic, like you say, hey, drive like a girl insurance, you're targeted a demographic. You might not wear it, right? You might get a lot of people say, hey, I'm a price buyer. I don't care if it's called don't drive like a girl insurance, I'm buying it. So <laughs> I think it's a really interesting point, that commercial um, personal lines. You could see in this industry, and I'm a true believer, that the distribution of insurance products could completely be changed mm-hmm. by large platforms like like the guys on this on this panel today. Yeah. Um, 
Ty, Courtney, I'm, I'm going to be fascinated to hear what your advice is here to, to sort of brokers that want to enter this space and, and underwriters that, that might want to consider, you know, insuring companies like yourself. You know, I'd, I'd say not it's in a negative term, but disruptive and, and innovative companies. You know, what would be your advice to them? Definitely. I think what's exciting about the two sided marketplace B2B as opposed to the B2C is that you have to think about it from a from a bigger play when it comes to the business mm-hmm. and that they're going to need more insurance because mm-hmm. they're taking on a lot more risk, not just the brick and mortar, but they have employees uh, outside of it, contractors mm-hmm. and they have also commission based um, employees as well. So those are two different mm-hmm. ones. So if they can think on the the bigger scale, OK, they can offer more insurance coverage that's going to be a, a big play for them. But then they go to the licensed professional, which they don't, they're not really educated as much yet. They, they're, they're thinking mm. money, marketing, and probably insurance somewhere down the line. Mm. They're not understanding the protection that they need to have undergirded for not just themselves, not just their tools, not just their products, not just their brand and business as a whole, but also their clients. So I think that mm. if you're thinking about, you know, uh, doing business with the two-sided marketplace, look at it from one side as a bigger scale, and, and a grand, and then look at the other side, it's just a multitude of smaller businesses, mm-hmm. which will give them mm-hmm. a more of a leg up because it takes a lot of marketing, it takes a lot of education. And we, we're seeing that with a lot of the data that we're understanding from yeah. a lot of our licensed professionals that they're not thinking about that. But yeah. Once you bring it to their attention and the pandemic itself brought a lot of attention to mm-hmm. what we're doing, but it also gives them the opportunity if they wanna start a business in this social media uh, start tech world that, that we're starting to uh, get enlightened with and, and starting to grow, they're starting to be their own, their own business. And, and, yeah. and they don't, they don't wanna have to manage a team of anyone, just a team of one, mm-hmm. but we have to educate them on, and understand why they need insurance, mm-hmm. even if they don't use it. Because I think a lot of people have this, this quasi mm. thought process, you know, why do I need insurance? <laughs> Nothing may not happen. I may not need it, but you never think about insurance until you need it, whether it be a car wreck. Yep. And I never forget growing up, my dad would always say, if you had a, a, a rinky dink car, at least get, you know, coverage for someone who may who you may hit, even if they hit you, you can't, you don't want it anymore, but also just have insurance. So you know that there's protection and that you're going to be taken care of, or you're going to take care of the other person. So just educating them on the necessary need of it, uh, as opposed to saying, you know what, I don't think so. It's just a waste. Uh, That's going to be the big win for an, an insurance company. I think that's a that's a good point about the education piece. Like you guys don't have to know everything about beauty and barbering, mm-hmm. right? You guys don't have to know everything about micro transportation or um, or RVs. You know that leave that to us. You know where where you come in is you know because we're already tracking the macro trends, like the macro trends in our industry. And again, because we've been doing this for thirty years. And beauty has fed our family for three decades now. Like we've been through Ebola, we've been through Y2K, we've been through the 07, 08 recession and now COVID, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being in this evergreen industry, we've seen the ups and downs and the crossroads. And so we understand how this industry in particular will bounce back. It's just like a boomerang. And so, you know, we rely on you Mm -hmm. guys to help us educate our user base. Just like, you know, Chris, we had that webinar. I'm so grateful that you guys came on Mm -hmm. and said, yeah, you know what? We understand that insurance this may not be a sexy topic in the beauty <laughs> industry, but we'll be there for you guys to do a 30 minute webinar yeah. to help educate people on the, the brass tacks of why it is important and why it is something you should consider. And so again, you know, we just rely on us to be the subject matter experts in our industry. And we rely on you guys to be the subject matter experts in your industry. And we'll find some way to, to work together. Yeah, I, th- I think it's such a, an interesting point you make. You know, insurance isn't known for its simplicity in its products. I mean, even when I read my own car insurance, I'm going, I'm going to have to read this again because I'm not a lawyer. This is, right. this is tough. And then that is definitely something that we need to do. And when there is a marketplace that's selling to their users, that insurance product needs to be simple. It's often mm-hmm. advertised. It's yeah. often explained to them. And if we start using this complex legal insurance mm-hmm. jargon, yeah, of course, people don't understand why they need insurance. It just becomes exhausting. Yeah. It's a They're terrible of customer it. experience. Yeah, yeah, I agree and, with you. And definitely, especially for us, because our industry is full of creatives, right? They get into this space not to think <laughs> about finance and accounting and legal and insurance. They get into this space to make people feel and look amazing. And so mm. the more we can take on the brunt of, you know, doing all yeah. the hard, non-sexy stuff on the back end, um, the better we'll, mm. we'll all be. And with us dealing with a lot of deregulations in the, in the states right now, 
with people deeming that, you know, not just not we're essential, but do we need the really the professional license and huh. the hours? So, yeah. you know, what's going to happen when the franchises are hiring yeah. the, 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 the small franchises that mm. are the big franchises saying that, you know, we, they don't need hours. Just, they just need 500 hours when they, in, in, in essence, they need a thousand, they need 1500. Mm -hmm. We just need to bring them in here and we'll teach them the rest. Mm. That is going to really hurt that licensed professional because now when they get out there on their own, they don't know the business. And mm -hmm. when you don't have that acumen, you're, de mm -hmm. you're deemed to fail. So the deregulation laws have to be changed. And with me being on the PBA, PBA Advisory Council Board, Pro Beauty Association, I'm talking to the lobbyists and we're, we're looking to change those things. Mm -hmm. That's great, Ty. Thank you. And we haven't had too many questions on, on the chat. I think it's because people have probably been glued to, to listen to what you guys are talking about because uh, it's been fascinating. But And, and I'm confident we might run out of time, but I definitely want to just ask you all a final question. Uh, and it's a, it's a big question, so apologies in advance. But you know, what do you see as, as the future of your business and the, and the wider sharing economy? You know, I think it's a lot of people talked about COVID you know, could be the, the death of the sharing economy, which a lot of people said, because when you're sharing things in a pandemic, it kind of makes it difficult. For me, I think it, you guys will come out the other side and, and just be seeing, like, like Colin said and all of you have said, just will grow to a new level. Um, but I'd love your view on the future. Um, I'm fascinated to hear what you've got to say. So Erin, do you want to kick that off? Yeah, so I think one of the things that we have realized is, you know, if we are willing to be flexible and adaptable and we have a product um, that, that we can build upon uh, to customize for the needs of our partners, that we actually can adapt quite well uh, to the COVID and, and soon the post-COVID economy. Um, so for us, that meant, you know, thinking about uh, at the height of the pandemic, how to get uh, essential workers in the supply chain to work, uh, to keep the supply chain running and to help doctors and nurses um, uh, yeah, get to hospitals uh, and then to, you know, branch out more into logistics uh, and think about you know how to get groceries to vulnerable people and how to get lunches to school children who formerly depended on school lunch um, but were not able to physically come into their schools um, and thus became food insecure and needed a distribution network for those meals um, or you know kids who had special needs who needed to be among the first to return to schools when they reopened but their bus routes were no longer running uh, so thinking about how to to bring them back uh, and being able to iterate in that way so I think there's an you know, sort of endless number of possibilities and permutations that have emerged from COVID and that affect how people will get around the world. And as we pay attention yeah. to those trends and develop new products that are relevant for the marketplace, you know, we just need to constantly recalibrate and think about how to ensure those products. Um, and for me, thinking about the future of insurance, you know, I think about the future of work and the gig economy. Um, and really, as you have more people who are um, participating in the sharing economy, who are micro entrepreneurs and, and small business people who might not fit into the traditional employment model, you know, thinking about how are these people going to access, you know, health insurance and health care and the things that are important to making them function as small business people and make their lives sustainable. And so I'm very interested mm -hmm. in these dialogues around, you know, portable benefits for independent contractors and how insurance can be part of that solution that makes small businesses run. Um, and, you know, thinking about making sure that our driver partners have the very best insurance that they need co to continue to operate as independent business people, you know, whether that's a special product for period one when they're in multiple apps um, and they're using a few different apps and trying to find the best, um, you know, options for them, um, you know, not having prohibitive costs of insurance. Um, you know, I talked to so many drivers that say that for them, you know, in a period of COVID and a lot of uncertainty, insurance became, you know, a constant worry and a big cost and something that they had to think about. And we at VIA, we very much want to think about not only insurance, um, you know, for the business and the platform, but also how, how drivers on the platform can, can continue to be sustainably insured in the sharing economy. Um, and the last thing I would mention is I'm super interested in you know, some of the stuff that Colin was talking about, about a way for insurance to not only be a cost center for your business, but to really be a driver of revenue. Um, and to think about, you know, mm -hmm. especially for us at VIA, you know, where we have this um, sort of um, a, a model of uh, being a full, full stack transit solution for our city. <coughs> Um, so we have our backbone as our software, but then we'll provide whatever else the city needs to launch a turnkey transit solution, whether that's vehicles or drivers or, um, you know, customer service support, um, marketing, advertising, compliance, regulatory support, and increasingly insurance, delivering insurance as part of yeah. that full stack solution. Um, and so I think there's a tremendous opportunity there, and I'm really excited about having partners to explore it with. Yeah, could not agree more. It's something Colin and I have, have spoken a lot about. Um, again, fits into that partnership model. If people have aspirations to take a more active role in insurance, even become a, an insurance broker licensed in themselves or, or, or take the big step and have you know, their own insurance company. You know, I think it's, there's, there's partnership, of, you know, partnership opportunities for all of us there. 
Colin, I, I, we're running slightly late on time, so quick view on the future. Yeah, I'll make it quick so then we can have some time for this year's share, folks. Um, yeah, I, I think, look, the future, outdoorsy, Airbnb of the outdoors, the OS for the outdoors, right? Like, mm. that's the natural extent. Um, RV's got to stay somewhere every night, uh, and there's so much to do outdoors. So the, the journey has just begun on that side of it. Uh, on the insurance side of it, you know, like Chris just touched on, like, I, we are going, you know, very much into this business Romley, which is becoming, you know, it started with rental insurance. Now it's gone to policy sales. Um, and now it's mm. gone to building our own policies um, and getting the licensing to do all of that. Um, you know, yeah. at, at the end of the day, like we all still work together, uh, but the, the company as a whole is changing its DNA to have insurance within it. We're hiring industry veterans, Metro Mile, Hartford, um, insurance all over the place to bring that in-house and have that expertise. Uh, but we still need these great partnerships to be able to do it at scale um, and to have like a, you know, good optionality for our money uh, in terms of, you know, how we go about doing this. So that's the, that's the big picture. So I'll, I'll share a little bit of my time for the, the share. Thanks, show. Colin. Uh, thanks, Colin. Hey, one thing Courtney know, of the final say. Yes. One thing we know uh, before Courtney speaks is we know that change is inevitable. Yeah. And so we know that, you know, the licensed professionals and the host, they have to adapt. We know that there needs, there, there has to be flexibility. And like Aaron said, portability, uh, just for the, the, the efforts that we put into educating our hosts, educating our licensed professionals, knowing that as, as now with the scheduling apps and with the calendar apps, these, like, these small businesses are going to grow massively in the next five to 10 years. And so brick and mortar is going to always be there because mm -hmm. they're needed, but the small businesses are going to grow as a team of one, two, three. Mm -hmm. uh, but we know those independent contractors are growing every, every single day. So we mm -hmm. have to really understand why we're putting together such a big plan, not just for those licensed professionals, but for those brick and mortars as well, so that they can, so that they can lead the charge and, and show how important it is because they're not teaching this in schools right. and they're not teaching this at the, at the franchises. So it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really going to be uh, effort led by Share Share and uh, all those other licensed professionals who are influencers to say how important it is to have insurance. Mm -hmm. So we know that the future is really big and it's really bright. The pandemic yeah. showed us that the epidemic yeah. we had in Texas with the weather has shown us that. So we're just moving forward and making that charge now. Yeah, I, I think everyone on this call would say that, you know, not many of us go to a salon or massage therapist, nail tech, um, barber, mm -hmm. because of the marquee name on the outside of the building. We go because I'm asking for a tie. I'm asking for Courtney to do my hair. And so understanding that that loyalty lies within the service provider and the end client, that's mm -hmm. where the magic happens. And so our goal is to make sure that whatever B2B tool you need to be successful, whether that is portable benefits, whether that is professional liability insurance by the day, whether that is space to work because that literally sits at the beginning of the stylist life cycle, whether that is retail sale through, uh, finance, accounting, quarterly taxes, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on. We want to, again, be able to provide that for you on your mobile device and allow you to pay for what you use. We are helping mm -hmm. other small businesses, again, build a top of our small business. And so for us, that, that is the future. The future of beauty, it's, it's owned by the independent stylists. Yeah. Awesome. Guys, a personal thank you. Um, for me and I'll pass it to Rosie but fascinating conversation really appreciate it appreciate it a huge thank you to you all that was an incredible hour it went so quickly and what a topic I mean there is so much more to be said on this topic but I think the one big takeaway from the insurance industry and the insurance community is there's still so much more work to be done in this space and partnerships is key you know uh, Chris and his team at iBot have really demonstrated how meaningful change can really impact these companies and more exciting than that impact the every man on the street. Um, and that's you guys as well. So it's like it's change for everyone, which is only a happy outcome. Um, and um, just quickly before we go, um, we do have another event next Tuesday, which um, we'll be hearing from uh, the Hiscox London CEO, Kate Markham, and she'll be discussing um, Syndicate Showcase. But thank you all for being here today. And if you do have time to do the survey, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>